Welcome everybody to the Too High Podcast. I'm Seth Galina alongside my co-host, Deontay Lee. Deontay, what's going on? Not much, man. You, you get <laughs> all this sing song in the intros, man. You're going to turn into a Sesame Street character one day. Uh, okay, uh, on the podcast today, we talk Jaguars. Uh, this is our second like big Jaguars episode, but it's it important because they just finished their super wild, super crazy coaching search by naming Doug Peterson the head coach. Uh, over there, so we talked to uh, Jaguar's beat reporter, uh, publisher for Jaguar, Jaguar Report, uh, our friend of the podcast, John Shipley, and to go over uh, what it was like in the Urban Meyer era of Jacksonville right. football, um, the coaching search, and how it led to Doug Peterson, all the issues they had finding someone, uh, basically finding someone to work with Trent Baalke, and then and then the fit with Doug Doug Peterson and Trevor Lawrence. Free agency issues, you know, going into into um, into free agency period soon, and then and then who we think um, fits them well in the draft. So um, yeah, I think it was a, a honestly a very delightful, an enlightening episode wow. talking about the Jaguars and all that stuff. And I think you guys will will really enjoy it. Um, so all those adjectives know. let you know that Seth was just writing something this morning. <laughs> so I got all those adjectives in mind. <laughs> a mock draft kind of specifically. Been- my, my drafts are great for, for your adjective work. No, we're not going to talk about no mock drafts. D- did I do a mock draft recently? No, I don't think, I don't think that's true. Who, who's to say? Who could say? But <laughs> if you wanted to go look at my mock draft, go to pff.com. And right now, until February 14th, you can get 25% off any PFF subscription. And uh, you know what you can get with a PFF sub. Uh, all PFF's locked article content. Um, PFF Greenline, uh, go go find your your favorite Super Bowl bets. There's a whole bunch of them. Greenline is up 27 units this season. Uh, great, in my opinion, great for player prop tools. And also the NFL Draft Guide just came out. That is a beautiful, beautiful uh, piece of work there that I know um, Andrew Russell, who does a lot of the graphic design, puts in a lot of work for that. And Mike Renner puts in like some work for the for the actual analysis. So that's great. Um, also, the Two High Podcast is sponsored by Western and Southern Financial Groups. Uh, while, you f- while you focus on your roster moves, Western and Southern helps advance your money moves. Buying your first home, planning to start a family, wondering how, your, how to make your money grow. Western and Southern's playbook of life insurance, investment, and retirement solutions helps you rest assured on game day. Team up to understand needs and address goals with a game plan built just for you. Get started at westernsouthern.com slash PFF. All right. Uh, stay tuned for our interview with John Shipley. Ladies and gentlemen, the Too High Podcast is joined now by a friend of the pod, uh, Mr. John Shipley, publisher for Jaguar Report, or Jaguar's Report. Um, Mr. John Shipley, what's going on? Ah, I'm doing fantastic. Uh, it's, it is Jaguar Report. I spent probably the first year and a half writing for them thinking it was Jaguars before I was, before I was corrected. So, learning experience for everybody. And so you are the publisher. This is the University of South Alabama Jaguars we're talking about here. <laughs> uh, I mean, considering I, on-field results, might might as well be. <laughs> I, I feel like I, I'm pretty sure John would be sleeping a lot a lot deeper at night if he recovered. Yeah, <laughs> he I, I I wish at this point. I, I I'd, I'd be seeing you know important games. Well, you'd get like easy access to the Senior Bowl, I guess. Or you'd be there. That's the no, one. I wouldn't. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, so, so uh, John covers the Jaguars, and because of the kind of batshit crazy year, uh, or at least even two years that the Jaguars have been have been uh, tracking on, we wanted to have you on, especially with this last month of this, uh, frankly hilarious coaching search. Um, that led to Doug Peterson being hired a couple days ago by the Jaguars as a new head coach. He wanted to get you on just to go through, like, what the fuck is going on in Jacksonville. <laughs> so let's start because, like, we'll get, through, we'll get to the coaching staff pretty quickly, the coaching search pretty quickly. But I want to start with, you, you know, two years ago, you get a 1-15 team. And that's like, you're thinking, that's the bottom of the barrel. That's it. Like, there can't be yeah. anything worse than this. You know, the tank just to go uh, and get the, the best generational prospect of all time. And then 2021 happens. And they win at least one more games than one win 
but you have Urban Meyer and everything that that entails. So can you, wait, what was the, the mindset, the mind frame, your psychological, your, your psyche uh, going from that 1-15 in 15 to what happened with Urban Meyer in 2021? Well, I was naively excited when Urban got hired just from a reporter's perspective because, you know, they, they went, when they went one and 15, it was, it was a boring one and 15. You know, I wasn't even like a dysfunctional, you know, like drama one and 15. It was just a, you know, we stink. I, I know like one Jaguars em- employee told me that he was like, you know, I've been here for a number of years. Uh, it, it's so weird that by far the worst team I've been around are the guys I like the most. And I was like, yeah, man, it was, it was legitimately, you know, a team of, you know, nice dudes, but it was, you know, just a boring and bad team. So that, that, that entire year felt like a march uh, when, like, the biggest story every week was, are they going to start Mike Glennon or Gardner Minshew? That kind of gives you an idea. <laughs> yeah, an <laughs> idea of what the psyche was. Like, like, the most drama they had was Minshew not revealing a hand injury. So it, it, that was a pretty, like, boilerplate year. It, it, it wasn't one that I enjoyed. I enjoyed covering the 2019 team a lot more. So I went into the urban hire with some optimism that, okay, this will be a team that, you know, even if it crashes and burns, it'll be interesting to follow. I wish I could go back in time and warn myself, you know, what, <laughs> what I was <laughs> what I was about to get into and to not put my mindset, you know, in a place to be excited because, I mean, it, it really was. You know, obviously there was more national attention and more kind of eyes focused on the Jaguars strictly because of Urban Meyer uh, and because of Trevor Lawrence, but it went exactly how – Really, everybody outside of Jacksonville, you know, said, said it would go, you know, both on and off the field. And, you know, I get to the point where you're talking about so much drama, you know, both on the record and off the record. Like, you know, he, he'd come in for a Monday press conference and it'd be an entire press conference about, hey, why are you and, you know, James Robinson not on the same page at all? And, you know, it wouldn't be anything at all about, you know, why is the offense scored one touchdown in the last six weeks? You know, it just it became so much less about football and so much more about the dysfunction that, you know, when, when people say, like, you know, a building gets tense, that I, I believe that extends to the media, too. You know, I would walk into the stadium and it would it was just a tense environment. You know, it was like walking on egg so, eggshells. It wasn't, you know, a place you could be relaxed or loose. It was, you know, you're kind of always waiting for another shoe to drop. You know, it's it started with, obviously, the video in the restaurant. I'm not even probably I was about to call it the grinding video. <laughs> I'm not even sure <laughs> probably what to, what to accurately call it. I think I think. Uh, some of our more reputable places called it like inappropriate dancing with a woman who was not his wife. <laughs> so I saw it in an ESPN article, oh, but it, 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 it started with that. And then just from down, down, down there, like it covering a uh, dumpster fire is not as fun as I, I thought it'd be. Cause I mean, it, it legitimately, you know, like, like Deontay mentioned, man, there are like times where, you know, I like, I, he got fired at almost 1 a.m. So, I mean, that kind of summed it up, you know, like I couldn't go to sleep without, you know, them not doing something absolutely ludicrous. So I kind of have two questions for you kind of in that, in that light, what was the first moment in the facility where you realized like, this is going awfully, like completely awfully for all parties involved. And then what was the moment, you know, maybe it's obvious, you know, something that we saw publicly or maybe something that you could tell from being close to the situation what was the moment where you were like, all right, this is ending in 2021. Like this, it's clear that this regime is not surviving 2021. Yeah. I, I, I think the two things that I first saw both came before the, even week one even happened. It was in training camp. He did something called a winner loser day where they would. That, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, obviously, Hey, it worked for him at Ohio state. I remember, uh, you know, Josh Perry, I interviewed him and he told me all about winner loser day. And then I told him they were doing it at the NFL level. <laughs> it was like, Oh, okay. And, you know, it was like Joe Schobert and Tim Tebow going up against each other in special teams drills. I'm like, I, I don't see what anybody is gaining from that, you know, as a football team, and let alone Joe Schobert and Tim Tebow. I mean, I, I even think Schobert lost some of them. So probably his credibility <laughs> took a pretty big hit there. And then I, I was telling Seth this, but week one of the preseason, Urban was all about, you know, hey, everybody who's healthy is going to play in the preseason. I need to see these guys on the field. I've never seen them before. And Cleveland did the exact opposite. You know, I think they sat like over 20 healthy dudes. It was mostly third stringers, a couple second stringers. And Cleveland just ab- stuffed the Jaguars' first and second string defense into a locker. I-, I think Case Keenum went like 12 for 13 for like 150 <laughs> yards or something. And after the game, when we talked to Urban, you know, I, I remember talking to Doug Marone after preseason games, and he'd be like, yeah, you know, it went bad, but, you know, we're it, it happens. It's preseason. We're going to look at it. Urban – it looked like it was the worst loss of his life. And I remember, I think, 
Peter King did a story on Urban after that, and it he, in the story he said Brandon Linder, the center, came up to Urban and slapped him on the back and said, "Coach, it's the effing preseason. It's okay." <laughs> so I think I, I I think that was a pretty big indication to me. And then when I really knew it wasn't going to work was I, I mean just after that you know incident in Columbus, you know in the bar, I think. The biggest thing uh, as a head coach is you have to have credibility inside the locker room. You know, it, you, you can say all these things about, you know, plus two mentality, you know, being uh, accountable, being exceptional, all those things. But if people aren't selling where you're buying, then, you know, it's a wasted message and it's a waste of everybody's time. And I think after he did something like that and then after how he handled it, you know, there, there were players openly mocking him you know, behind his back because of how he handled it. You know, he didn't handle it in the team meeting very well. So I just think just after that, I, I think it was clear to me that, okay, this this can't, you know, continue to go on. Yeah, it's funny how, like, we, we joke the whole offseason being like, because, you know, we're talking about a guy who's, like, the winningest in terms of, like, percentage, like the winningest head coach in college football history, basically. Yeah. And, you know, the jokes in the offseason were like, <clears throat> well, what happens when he, like, loses three games? Like, he's never lost... I don't have the numbers in front of me, but he's never lost more than like three games in a season. I would bet he's never lost more than three games in a season or, or four games a season. Like, And that is probably very clearly going to happen, right? Even if you're the number one seed, you've probably lost three or four games. Yeah. And like, what is that going to do to his psyche? And it's so funny that, that that's exactly what happened. And it happened before he even had an official loss on his record against like Cleveland. Like that's <laughs> wild to me that it all came true. And, uh, and yeah, it was just bad. Like, um, when you when you uh, when you th- when you think about this season, do you think you know? M- my idea going into the season, especially with where the AFC South was, I was like, hey, you know, there is a chance the Jaguars. Yeah. There, there, there's a chance the Jaguars like figure something out and get in maybe as a wild card, um, win enough games, go nine and eight, something like that. And then obviously th- th- that was never going to happen, um, you know, looking back in hindsight. But like, do you think maybe a different coaching staff, someone with more NFL experience could have molded this team into maybe not nine and eight, um, considering how bad we, we now know they, they were, but like five wins, six wins, seven wins, something like that? Yeah, I mean, just the freezing cold take myself or whatever it is. I said they're going to win between six and seven games. I I look like an absolute you know loon, you know, considering all all the results that happened. Because I thought the same thing. You know, I thought getting Lawrence, you know, that they had a respectable group of weapons between Robinson, Marvin Jones, Chenault, Shark. So I I I did think that coming into the season they weren't as far away as they clearly you know ended up being. But I think, like you said, a, a competent coaching staff, like I. I say if you hire, you know, Doug Peterson and, you know, have, you know, a, an average staff of his, you know, from the Philadelphia Eagles, I think they'd probably look a lot like, you know, the Eagles from Doug Peterson's first season. You know, it, you know, probably right below the 500 mark, you know, more inconsistent than everything, but at the very least competitive. But it, this was a team that it just – it was clear that they weren't going to be competitive, like just from the first week of the season. I mean, even beyond the preseason, the first week of the season, I think their very first drive, it went false start. Uh, illegal formation, sack, incompletion. So I, it, it, it was just, you know, a team that was coming apart at the seams before it ever started. So I do think, like, even an average coach probably gets them, you know. Like, Trevor Lawrence doesn't throw 12 touchdowns with an average coach. I, I think that just happens because, you know, Urban's side of the ball was a complete mess. So, you know, in that vein, <clears throat> to kind of keep it on the simple end, if you had to put, like, a percentage point on it, how close or far away do you think this team is from being – um, competitive. I won't say good or contending, but from being competitive, like you think they're halfway there. Is this like a one season turnaround? Is this multiple off seasons that you think um, to kind of get this, to kind of get the black cloud that's been hanging over them in 2021 off of them? Yeah, no, I, I think they were in enough one score games, both, you know, in 2020 and a few last year against quality opponents that you can talk yourself into them. You know, if they add enough pieces in the offseason, you know, between the draft and free agency, I believe they have, you know, the second most cap space entering free agency and they have 12 draft picks. I think you could talk yourself into them being, you know, at least a, a mildly, you know, an NFL team, you know, not whatever they were last year. So I, I, I do think the road to at least, you know, being an average team is there. I, I just, you know, in terms of percentage, I'd probably put it closer to, you know, probably around 50. And a, a big reason for that, them even being that high is obviously 
uh, Trevor Lawrence. If, if they didn't have Trevor, then obviously it'd be much lower. But I, I'm expecting a jump from him in year two. So I think overall, you know, they, if, if they can hit the right investments in the offseason, I think they can get closer to, you know, kind of that, you know, like we said, that Eagles model where, you know, year one, you know, you're close to 500. You're not a, you're not even really a good team, but, you know, you're not a bad team either. And then year two, start making the Okay, uh, let's we'll get into the offseason stuff and the draft stuff in a minute. But first, it's time uh, to talk about Manscaped. <laughs> <laughs> All right. it's, what, it's what I came on for. <laughs> yeah, do you, do you want to do the read? Let's like mouth as I'm speaking. You can mouth it too, and you can act like you're part of the ad read. I don't All think right. that that help. I don't think that, I, that's a good thing for anybody. <laughs> I don't know? think I want to do. That. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't enticing. <laughs> All right, roses are red, violets are blue. Don't let a wild pube wreck you. Valentine's Day is just around the corner, and our sponsors at Manscaped are here for you with the best tools to get your skin ready for the special occasion. This V-Day, it's time to join the 4 million people worldwide who trust Manscaped, the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. With our exclusive offer, go to manscaped.com and use promo code PFF for 20% off and free shipping. Uh, you know, With the Manscaped uh, Performance Package 4.0, which is like the best thing that, they, that, that you can get from in my opinion, um, comes with everything. comes with the, the, the razor, which is great. comes with the ear and nose hair trimmer. comes with um, the ball toner. Uh, which, you know, if you got, if you got sweat problems, I suggest it. Um, all right. Manscaped <laughs> created their products like literally for February 14th. Um, so, you know, get, get the performance package 4.0, get everything you want with 20% off and free shipping. If you use the promo code PFF at manscaped.com, 20% off free shipping with the promo code uh, PFF at manscaped.com. Join Cupid and shoot your arrow with Manscaped this Valentine's Day season. As you can tell by my beard, I haven't used the Manscaped products recently, but uh, I'll get on that soon. All right. Let's talk about this fucking crazy coaching search. First coach fired in the NFL, and then it took until February to find a replacement in Doug Peterson. And everything we heard was one of the issues was not a lot of people wanted to work with the Jaguars general manager, Trent Baalke. And I guess that's the first question is like, how true is that? Like, is that like, we're hearing all these rumors, like, especially with Byron Leftwich kind of making the ultimatum saying like, I want to bring in Adrian Wilson from the Cardinals um, to run, to, to run the team with me. And then them being like, no, Trent Baalke, I guess is the, is a GM and that's it. Um, how true is that? Is that like far from the truth? Is that something we've all made up or like what's going on there? I, I, I don't think it's something that's far from the truth at all. I, it, here's how I'll put it. When uh, the owner, Shad Khan, got asked, uh, the, literally right off the bat, his first question from everybody's favorite egg uh Gene Fournette, was uh, he, 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 Gene asked him, you know, right off the rip, did you offer the job to any other coaches? And, you know, he didn't say yes or no. And then he followed up. He's like, so is that a no? And Khan goes, we didn't get far enough to where any coach was meeting our players like Doug is. So I'm like, okay, then that's, you know, straight up. If that's, you know, if that's your baseline, then it's pretty clear, you know, you had other coaches in mind also. And I just, I, I don't think you can point to anything other than, you know, Trent Baalke's presence, you know, wh whether it's justified or not, you know, it's nothing personal against him, but it's just, you know, very clear throughout the league that, you know, it's a reputation, you know, especially for coaches that, you know, this might not be the most optimal, you know, guy to work with, you know, that graphic goes around of, you know, in his last five seasons as general manager, you know, five head coaches have been fired, you know, you can maybe not count Doug Marone because he was, you know, general manager for like two or three games during his tenure, but you can definitely count, you know, all the 49ers guys, you can count Urban Meyer because, I mean, if you even go back to Urban Meyer's Columbus incident, he said that, Trent Baalke was was basically the person who told him, hey, it's OK if you don't get on the plane. You know, it's OK if you stay in Cincinnati or whatever. So I, I think you just look at, you know, relation. the big thing about being a general manager. People think it's, you know, scouting, 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 you know, grinding tape. It's about relationships, you know, fostering relationships inside the building, developing an organization, the front office, but also fostering relationships outside the building. Because when it comes to free agency, you know, you're not going to see a guy that you're targeting sign elsewhere and then start grinding tape being like, okay, who's the next best receiver. You, you, you're going to start calling people, you know, it's just, it's just how the NFL works. It's how the N NFL business works. And bulky is somebody who I think, you know, with his like 
archetype of general manager is a film grinder. You know, it's not a guy that talks to agents. It's not a guy who's savvy with contracts. It's, you know, he, he grinds film. And I think when you consider, you know, just the relationships that he's had, the NFL level, I do think it's accurate that, you know, a lot of coaches were hesitant to work with him. I think even uh, Albert Breer of SI reported that even Doug Peterson at first was hesitant to work with him. So I don't think it's a surprise that the Jaguars, you know, at the same press conference they're announcing their head coach, they also said, hey, we're hiring an executive vice president to be this guy's boss, and we're also hiring a ton more people for the front office. It's like, it's weird because you, you ask yourself, if they know they have to, like, get a buffer for people to even take their calls, then why don't you just, you know, maybe change the general manager? But I, I, I do think the Leftwich and Wilson smoke, you know, was accurate. I don't think it's something that was made up at all. And let you know, the the Jaguars and anybody else can try to sell it all they want. But Leftwich was a guy who, you know, at one point was firmly, you know, in 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 the plans, and it ended up not working out. So I don't, I don't think it's a coincidence that they interviewed Doug Peterson on December thirtieth, and then almost I think it was like four weeks and five days later he had a Jesus. second interview. But hey, like, yeah. that that does that doesn't happen if he's the guy that you look at from the very very start. Right. So, you know, I'm kind of glad, you know, what you brought up in the latter part of your statement, because, you know, me, me, obviously, as an Eagles fan, I was kind of front and center for a lot of Doug Peterson's falling out with um, Howie Roseman, Jeffrey Lurie and kind of the the power circle that exists in like those executive offices for Philadelphia. Um, And I know that there's still, you know, some hard feelings that exist there. At least there's there's definitely been nothing in terms of reporting that has suggested that things have cooled, you know, and people feel better about each other than they did at the end of that tenure. So with that in mind, like, have you gotten anything in, you know, your collection of information and sourcing material that lets you know how Jacksonville plans to kind of reconcile the way that people might feel about Trent Baalke? Is there anything in terms of, like, you know, Doug Peterson's hesitation, maybe, or I guess a little bit of skepticism, like, is this executive vice president role really to play as a mediator? Um, Are they trying to, you know, kind of cut him bulky, at least away from so much of the day to day operational stuff, right? Like, how do you think that Jacksonville plans to reconcile, you know, this lack of relationship, I guess, or lack of positive relationships that bulky has had around the league? And is that going to influence the way things work in the building? Yeah, absolutely. The the way from my understanding, you know, from at least conversations is any EVP will essentially be, you know, the liaison between the football team and ownership and will also handle, you know, like you mentioned, the day to day activities in Jacksonville. You know, it, it, hold it's on, basically hold on, hold on. what the fuck does the general manager do then? <laughs> like, I don't understand the difference here. Uh, well, yeah, it varies, yeah, right? I, like, isn't the best yeah, answer it, is that it varies? It, it does vary. They do, a, they do a lot of, you know, like logistical stuff. And I, I know. So. <laughs> There was one crazy argument for keeping bulky on the radio. I heard it was like you know he hired all the equipment and training guys. So, you know, to keep him. Yeah, so, so while, while that's not a reason to keep who, him, you know, they, they, who in they God's name more. can fold the game pants on Saturday night <laughs> <laughs> if not uh, for bulky's guys? He knows the best, man. But <laughs> I, I, I think, like you said, you know, it's more or less basically what a general manager does. So I think the fact that you're hiring somebody to do that, like you know. It's basically what they had Tom Coughlin doing a few years ago, which I thought was a good idea. You just hired a bad person to do it because, right. you know, he was trying to still be a, a head coach and dictate everything. Right. But I think having somebody who can be, you know, kind of that eyes and ears for the owner is a positive thing when those eyes and ears aren't somebody who, you know, for better or worse, has a history of, you know, kind of backdoor politicking. And my understanding is, you know, and Balky kind of explained it a little bit more on – Saturday, he he said it would free him up to do more stuff with personnel, and he said that goes into scouting, finding mm-hmm. coaches. My understanding is he'd be doing a lot more traveling and a lot more in person scouting, a lot more you know okay. going around the schools, yeah, getting him away I from kinda, the building. That's the main thing. I <laughs> I kind of read I kind of read it as Trent, you know, go into this room and watch the San Diego State Center. Well, you know, we'll handle calling the agents for free agency and all that. Right. So right. I, I I I think if you want to call him, you know, like a scout with a general manager title like it's basically you know he reads like a director of scouting to me but Mm -hmm. i i think it's just because you know con and the jaguars have such a small circle like i'm not even gonna call it a tight circle it's just small because they don't talk to enough football people at least in my opinion that's why you know throughout the years you know shot con the only people he's gotten football advice from you know it's dave caldwell uh tom coughlin 
Dave Caldwell again for <laughs> a year. Right. And then, you know, Trent Baalke, the last year and a half, the only dude that's been in Con's year is Trent Baalke. So that is that is why I think he's ultimately staying, even if it's in like a, a neutered role completely. Like I, well, Somebody tweeted at me on Saturday and was like, I feel like I just watched the live neutering of Trent Baalke. <laughs> right. right. So, like, I guess my follow-up for that is like, where does that leave Shad Khan, right? If you're bringing in more to this regime you know to kind of not if, if not to be as harsh as to say to cut bulky all the way out of the process it's clear that they need more voices more cooks in the kitchen yeah like so where does that leave shad khan in terms of his involvement with football operations right like obviously he's yeah. not jerry jones but it's clear that he takes a decent a sizable amount of pride in trying to create some kind of winning product even if maybe some of the efforts are a little misguided right and you kind of detailed some of the relationships he's had and the influence that that still has had in some of the decisions that he makes from a football perspective is this also a way for Khan to say hey i'm just trying to get as many new minds in the building as possible so that way it's not on me so maybe i can go focus on my wrestling product that i, I really <laughs> really like that's very lucrative yeah, <laughs> I'm I, like I, it's just like just get more people in to mop up the mess so that way there's just less being asked of Khan, you know on a day-to-day yeah. i i think if you look at cons like his hiring record and the jaguars overall lack of success like they've only had one season under him where they haven't lost double digit games. You look at him and you're like, okay, that's not a successful owner. But if I'm a head coach, I think Khan's actually like an ideal owner because one, he's really patient. He is really loyal, you know, as Trent <laughs> as Trent right. Balky can attest to. Right. And he also he he like you said, you know, he's a guy that is actually willing to win. You know, he's not somebody who like just wants to call himself an NFL owner and he doesn't really care what happens. Like from everything I've seen, you know, he does want to win. He, Hasn't done a very good job at it, but you know it's at least been an attempt. So uh, as right. a head coach, you know they even, you know Urban Meyer uh, when he interviewed with the Jaguars, he told them he was only going to take the job if Khan would basically, you know, agree to facility upgrades. So the mm. Urban Meyer practice facility that Doug Peterson will be using in a few years, <laughs> that uh, you know, but it's like uh, it's like a hundred million dollar project or something that Khan you know signed off for before Meyer coached the game. So I, I think things like that, but I also think Khan. You know, like you said, I don't think he wants to be Jerry Jones. I, I don't think he even wants to be Robert Kraft. I truly right. think that he wants to put somebody he trusts in charge of the football operations. You know, Tom in 2018, uh, you know, he attempted with Urban last year and Trent. So he can step back and be like, mm-hmm. OK, you guys, you know, you guys handle this. You guys are the football guys. I'll support right. you in any way I need. So. I, I do think him wanting to add more people to the front office is that because, I mean, something I've been told, I this is a direct quote from, you know, somebody in the agent business is that Jacksonville had the least talented and like the worst death among all front offices in the NFL. You know, they have guys who have been there for 15 and 20 years and, you know, haven't moved up. You know, they, mm-hmm. it, it's basically, you know, a, a shallow grave in terms of ideas. You right. know, it, it was Trent Baalke. Urban Meyer, a couple of high level scouts, Tom Gamble, and then Tony Khan, who, you know, Tony Khan, who I think is brilliant. And honestly, if he had, you know, more pull and sway with the team, I think they'd be a lot better off. Mm -hmm. But even he, you know, he's more like undrafted guys and that kind of stuff. So I do think Khan does want to kind of take a step back because, I mean, the most involved he's been is when he hired Urban Meyer. And he even was like, you know, people wanted me to be more involved. So I'm controlling this search and ended up being one of the worst hires in. You know NFL history, so I I, I I I really do think he wants to just hire competent people and can kind of take a step back and you know let the football people do their thing. Two questions: What are the cool things you can do on Shotcon's yacht? And then B: What um, who are the names that have kind of been bandied about as the EVP in that in that kind of new position that they want to make? Yeah, uh, what was it? Uh, I believe there is two different like basketball hoops like on like the different ends of the yacht and one like one of the crew people like told me you know like they play pickup now and then I, I i'm not imagining like what it would do like if i tried to make a free throw and i just completely mail something into the atlantic ocean like that's now that's the only ball we have you know until i was gonna, gonna say do you get kicked <laughs> off if you air ball and it goes into the ocean do you get booted off the yacht yeah for that? <laughs> <laughs> but no it, it's it, it's it's crazy man it, it literally like everything you can think of you know it has and i'm like i i understand you know why somebody want to spend all their time on that and like never touch land again but and then as for the evp question rick spielman has been a really popular name uh, i know there's a lot of debate uh, especially between local media people i know uh you know several 
people who are plugged in in Jacksonville have said, you know, they've heard Rick Spielman of Jacksonville, but not as EVP. I just can't imagine a scenario where Rick Spielman, who by all accounts wanted to be like an EVP in Minnesota before he got fired, like he was willing to not even be general manager anymore. You know, he wanted to be like a senior consultant type guy. I don't see any world where he'd be like, okay, now I want to be an assistant general manager under, you know, Trent Baalke, a guy I've arguably, you know, have a better resume than. So I think he makes the most sense. And then also, you know, I just in terms of assistant GMs or potentially adding to the front office, uh, Omar Khan with the Steelers, you know, big cap guy with Pittsburgh. I think he, you know, would make a lot of sense for them. And then uh, Joe Horitz with Baltimore is another guy whose name uh, has kind of been out there. I, I think he would actually have a chance to, eventually, you know, climb into a general manager role in Jacksonville. Because, I mean, you know, you're not going to be the general manager in Baltimore anytime soon. But right. if you're the assistant general manager in Jacksonville, there's at least a path to you taking over for Balky, you know, if, if you know, dude's ever not general manager anymore. So, you know, kind of spinning this thing forward and talking about, like, actual items for Jacksonville, in your mind, what is priority number one now that you have your head man, you know, in charge, you know what the – what the front office more or less is going to look like, you know, and, and you kind of detailed some of the names and maybe some of the, the pedigree that they're, that they would like to bring in, like what's priority number one, once the staff is completely set and we are, you know, both feet down into the off season, how do, how do they get better for 2022? I, I think the big thing is, you know, and, and this is cliche for, you know, any team that has a young quarterback, but simply building around Trevor Lawrence. I mean, you look at their offensive like uh, skill, you know, depth chart, and then the fact that they have three offensive linemen, three starters set to hit free agency, the two most important backups and the offensive line set to hit free agency. The biggest thing is just build around Trevor. You know, get him, get him a non Laquan Treadwell starting receiver. You know, get him a non Chris Manhurts tight end. Beef up the offensive line, and then I mean, even that running back. You know, it, it, it's last April after the first round. If you would have said the Jaguars would need a running back, you know, this off season, people would have called you insane, but. Now they have, you know, two running backs coming off, you know, pretty significant season ending injuries. So I think just giving Lawrence, uh, you know, receivers who can bail him out of high leverage situations that that was something that they struggled with last year because he wasn't afraid to, you know, let it rip, especially, you know, deep. But they just consistently didn't fight back for the ball. You know, they would lose consensus situations there. There are a lot of instances where receivers, you know, were kind of at, at fault, you know, for Play's not working out. So I think just getting him that kind of alpha receiver who he can trust in those situations and overall just rebuilding the offensive line depth, I think those have to be their first priorities because, I mean, you look at the situation around Lawrence last year, both, you know, from a coaching perspective, obviously with Urban, but just from like a talent perspective, there was really nothing. I mean, there was one point last year where Jadon Mickens, Tavon Austin, and LeCron Treadwell were. You know, in, in a three receiver set for the Jaguars. That is a I mean, disgusting you know, you, combination of names. You're not, you're not going to win with that, man. You're, you're just not. You know, also getting wide receivers. You know, that run the right routes at the right depths at the right time. Yeah, you know? that 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 would help. Yeah, it's debatable, <laughs> but that that I mean, even playing them playing them in the right spot. You know, like when DJ Chark went down. For whatever reason, it, I I know the reason is because they built their receiver room terribly. But when DJ right. Chark went down, they put Lavisca Chenault at X, and I'm like he. He's struggling to run routes you know, from, the, right. from the slide. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. That's uh, that's no good. Uh, I'm, van- I, I'm 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 silent here because I'm trying to look up there some of the contested catch rates. But um, I, I want to ask you about this fit between Doug Peterson. Now his OC, we've heard Press Taylor most likely, who's been with him for for quite a while. Or, you know, Pep Hamilton, I think his name has been bandied about, or yeah. am I just thinking about yeah. yeah, okay, I'm right. Yeah, um, I was going to say, I, I kind of read that as, like, best name versus guy that the head coach is already exactly. comfortable with. And typically, <laughs> we can kind of guess which way these things lead. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so um, I think... It's like, go ahead. No, no like, just to his point, it's like everybody has a press tailor, like, in their life. Right. You know? Like, he's he just kind of ride for that. Uh-huh. Thing. I respect it. has a... I'm hey, I'm riding uh, up Seth's coattails all the way to the top, man. Yeah, sure. Uh, Jaguars <laughs> were 21st in contested catch rate uh, this season, so yeah, not very good. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so you're you're gonna get this Doug Peterson offense most likely, right? You know, because most likely Press Taylor is gonna be there and it's gonna run run all the stuff that they've that they've been doing um, uh, for a minute now. I I had said, I don't know, it was the last week or two weeks ago that I actually liked the fit of him in in this type of shotgun-based RPO type of offense. I really like 
what Lawrence is as a pocket mover. And I think giving him that type of space, like, don't get me wrong. Like, I think if, if Leftwich had come in and brought in that Arians type of system, the sorry, I should call it the Arians Leftwich type of system, where, you know, you're getting that heavy play action deep in the pocket type of situation. I think he would have been great too, because I think he's a really good quarterback. But I think, you know, because of that pocket movement, he, you can give him more five-man protections, more six with the, with a the running back checking out, um, in, you know, into a rut late, and just letting him move around defenders, right? Like giving him that space to move around defenders. So, um, yeah, I, your thoughts on the fit here between between Lawrence and and what we think the offense will look like? Yeah, no, I I, I agree with you completely. I think Peterson, I, it, it, at least the way I understand it, is. You know, he's going to be a lot more right in the trenches with Lawrence than maybe he yeah. was his last couple of years in Philadelphia. Yeah. You know, he's going to be right there with his development. And, I mean, I, I think if you just look at his skill set and Carson Wentz's skill set, th- this this isn't mean to insult Trevor Lawrence in any way, but I, I way I can kind of describe him talking to Eric Stoner about it, uh, formerly Bo Jackson, was you know, he's kind of ex- expensive taste Carson Wentz. You know, he's, he's no, big. he is, he has a, he, You know, big yeah. arm. Really quick on the RPOs, really mobile, hard to bring down. And I mean, when you think back to some of his best throws last year, it was throws when he was on the move. You know, like yep. that big throw to Jamal Agnew against Cincinnati. Uh, that throw against uh, the Patriots that he did look contrary. Well, I think it was his deepest throw of the season. That was mm-hmm. you know him moving out of the pocket, him ad libbing. So I think just like I, I think his athleticism, it's better you know in the pocket and moving around you know behind the line of scrimmage than he is you know as a threat past the line of scrimmage or something like that I, I just think as a quarterback he's most comfortable when you know he's doing those things like you said you know you're moving the pocket around and then i mean just not to compare any nfl offense to clemson's offense because you know uh, obviously not but i mean you no, know but- the similar shotgun rpo you know high tempo that's not what the jaguars were last year you know they were they were under center play action, you know, trying to hit deep and intermediate. So I, I honestly really like this fit in this offense because I think, you know, from a skill set perspective, he isn't that different, you know, from Wentz. Obviously, you know, if you're the Jaguars, you want him to work out better than Carson Wentz. But if you're Doug Peterson and you're looking at it the same way you were looking at it when you're building an offense around Wentz, I don't think you're having many different ideas. To me, like, and, and this is, uh, sorry to cut you off, Seth, but to me, one of the reasons why I really like in, in, in the time that I watched Doug Peterson's offense is just that, like any bit of talent at the wide receiver position has like just exponential growth for this offense, right? Like having two really good pass catchers with Zach Ertz and Alshon Jeffrey in 2017 won them a Super Bowl, even with Nick Foles as a quarterback, right? Like, and even as as like Alshon Jeffrey took a step back, Nelson Aguilar took a step forward, and now you still have you know maybe like one and a half good pass catchers between Ertz and Aguilar, and they were able to make that work. And these are not these are people who are productive, but we don't think about them yeah. like any top top echelon of guys at their positions, even though they've been good you know over the stretch of their careers. So you know to your point about addressing the wide receiver room and improving that rotation, just what that can add on top of having Peterson, who you know like. I think his best attribute is the ability to make some of these simple things look a thousand ways different, right? There's there's all this versatility within this offense, and we've seen different iterations of it through Philadelphia. You know, the emergence of Dallas Goddard, and then they were using more two tight end sets. You know, you have your time where they were super spread out. Like, you know, you can make an argument that they were probably the RPO team in the NFL that yeah. basically kind of ushered in this era of beating the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Um, so there's a lot... I think there's just a lot of meat on the bone that they can really attack with Trevor Lawrence and that development. And, you know, just from a coach brain perspective, which I'm always just a prisoner of, like to leave the Urban Meyer regime and bring in a guy like Doug Peterson. And, you know, there's just going to be a certain order of ways of things that are going to be done. And I think that that and that alone for a young quarterback is going to be great for development. And the offense is already kind of tailored to take away bad traits that you may already have. So some of the things we saw early in the year with Trevor really trying to force plays down the field or trying to extend maybe when you should just take the check down or eat it. Um, Being able to set up better protection so that way you're not asking your quarterback to have to solve so many problems after the snap. Like all of those things I think are huge deals for them. Um, do you think that this offense, because this is one thing that Peterson never had, was a really productive running back, do you think that this offense will work well for James Robinson? Um, and do you have any other kind of maybe feedback from the players or the players' agents or whoever you've been speaking to that kind of indicates how they might feel about what this new era of Jaguars football might look like? 
Yeah, no, I, I do think it'd be a good offense for James Robinson because, you know, when people think of James Robinson, you know, they think of a physical downhill runner, which, you know, all that's true, but people forget he's an excellent passing game running back. Right. You know, it, both 100%. pass protecting and, you know, he has really good hands. You know, he's obviously not the most explosive guy. You're not going to, you know, put him out wide and a- ask him, you know, to run routes, even though the Jaguars did do that <laughs> at times last year. But, right. I mean, he's a guy who I think Peterson will really enjoy because, you know, I, just pass, you know, his ability to help in the passing game. I mean, I, I know, you know, the Eagles, they coached running backs a little differently mm-hmm. on on RPOs. You know, they took some stuff from Chip Kelly where, you know, the running backs would have to kind of know quicker, you know, if, okay, am I getting the ball or not? Because they'd have to get out of there and not get in his way, you know, before he actually released the pass. You know, there's a video out there where uh, Peterson breaks down his RPO game with uh, Brian Baldinger. And it, it's, it's just, you know, wild, the little intricacies, you know, they ask out of their running backs. And Robinson is just such a smart running back that I, I I do think, you know, as long as he bounces back healthy, that'd be a good scheme for him. And I think even Travis Etienne, you know, as long as he comes back healthy, I think he's a guy who, you know, strictly as a pass catcher out of the backfield. I, I think, you know, this could be an offense that could honestly really be a boon for him compared to the bizarre role the Jaguars wanted for him last year where they wanted to split him out wide some. And just to oh me, you lose. God. Yeah, I forgot you, about you that. lose all you lose all of your tactical advantage when you put him on a defensive back, you know? And, and one time, uh, the bevel, even uh, the offense coordinator, somebody asked them, they're like, what's the difference with ETN hurt between him and Agnew? And he was like, well, the difference is Agnew can't run routes out the backfield. And then I'm like, you weren't even asking ETN to do that. So right. <laughs> what do you, what? Yeah. So, and I, overall though, I do think, you know, it's an offense that can really help him trend the right way in the running game. And, from everything I've heard, players, you know, have been excited. You know, some of the more higher name players, you know, that have some of the more core guys are excited. I think a lot of people, especially, you know, considering how Peterson was seen in Philadelphia, you know, I know there were, you know, some disgruntled players after that Jalen Hurts, you know, pulling him thing in week 17. But overall, when Peterson got fired in Philadelphia, you saw player after player come out and be like, you know, I love this guy. So I think players are excited, but I would say, there were players excited last year too <laughs> when when Urban was hired, but I, I think overall people in Jacksonville are happy to have uh, an adult in the building now. Yeah, not, uh, just to go back to that Wentz comp, uh, I it's he's Lawrence is is similar in in a, in a lot of ways to Wentz, and I think like exactly what both of you have said, it's just like he's Wentz. The the release is a little quicker, and we know that yeah, yeah. he has one of the quickest releases, but he's Wentz with like actual pocket management right like he's not going to yeah. get stepped on by his offensive lineman because he didn't realize what the hell's going on around him. you know what i mean like he's not going to get run into like the tackle's not going to run into him he's going to have to yeah. throw this ball up but he's more wants, instinctual yeah way more instinctual in terms of in terms of understanding you know spatial awareness and stuff like that than, than wentz is i think 100 percent. so yeah Absolutely. this offense i think is i think it's perfect i think it's perfect for him um, and then, you know, you talk about this receiving core, your latest you've heard or, or, your, or your personal thoughts on, you know, where they're going to go with like DJ Chark and, and some of those guys. Well, D- DJ Chark, th- this isn't something I heard, but just uh, I was reading through some comments the other day and I guess, you know, he took everything Jaguars related, you know, off all his social media, which isn't, you know, foreign for an impending free agent, but to me, it's kind of a timing issue because normally when you're an impending free agent and a completely new regime comes in, there aren't many guys who are, you know, kind of kept around. And the Jaguars did with some guys last year, like Cam Robinson and Dewan Smoot. But I just think, and I, I keep going back to Urban Meyer, you know, last year kind of gave Chark a scathing review before the season began of his 2020 season. You know, said he didn't play big enough, he didn't play strong enough. I'm not a believer that Urban Meyer actually watched a single 2020 Jaguars game. So I'm assuming he would get that kind of scouting report from the front office. And that, not, like I said, that's not me reporting anything. That's just me connecting dots, knowing Urban Meyer doesn't watch film. So I'm just I'm just assuming that that kind of negative scouting report would come from the front office. And that's a front office that's still there. So I, I do think it's unlikely that, you know, they – those two sides come to any agreement, which, you know, it stinks for Jacksonville because I mean, he, he legitimately really, really flashed in 2019, but injuries and quarterback play have kind of ruined it since then. So kind of trying to round out what this Jaguars team might look like in 2022 and 23. Do you have any kind of leaning on which way they might be going on the defensive side of the wall? 
Yeah, no, uh, Mike Caldwell has been the hot name at the defense coordinator. Not a lot of people know him, but he's linebackers coach for Tampa Bay. He uh, He's from the Andy Reid tree. You know, his first job in the NFL was as a defensive analyst for Reid in 2010. That's how him and Peterson know each other. But after uh, Todd Bowles left Philadelphia for Arizona, Caldwell followed him, and mm-hmm. he's been at every bowl stop since. You know, okay. with uh, you know, with the Jets, with Tampa Bay. I think he was his assistant head coach. You know, with the Jets. So I, I, I think they're likely going to bring him on, and that you're going to see kind of you know the defense that we see in Tampa. You know, really multiple in their coverages, and right. you know even the fronts they run, and a lot of you know a lot of their base defenses. I know uh, Charles McDonald and Stephen Rez did you know an an incredible article on Tampa Bay's defense before last year's Super Bowl where, you know, it's, they, they run base, you know, more than almost any other, any other defense and they have success doing it. So Mm -hmm. I, I think getting a attacking multiple scheme like Bowles has is likely what you'll see, which to me, uh, you you would know better than I would, but I don't think that's, you know, exactly the kind of defense he had in Philadelphia. No, I I definitely wouldn't say so. I mean, definitely not with uh, Schwartz and Intel, right? Like you're talking about very kind of cookie cutter ish, single high, four down, like why not? Exactly, 100%. And one of the things about Tampa Bay that I really like to the point about versatility is that they do put their best 11 on the field, basically, whatever whatever game situation it is that calls for it. So are there defensive guys maybe that you're kind of looking at to make immediate impacts that have not uh, maybe shown the development that you would like to see, whether they're rookie guys, some of the vets that they might have brought on? You know, obviously there wasn't a whole bunch of like high profile names that they brought up, you know, in terms of veteran free agents, but in terms of step four steps forward is like Josh Allen a candidate to take a step forward for you um what does that what does that picture look like what kind of improvements can we maybe see I, next? I need you to tell me if I should start standing Andrew Wingard as my new Daniel Sorensen that's oh, really God. the question that I need to know <laughs> if if I reply his dad's gonna find it out on the internet and tweet it at me again so <laughs> I, 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 I'm gonna take a step step back from it but just Chris Ash, I saw, got hired by the Raiders. So just me connecting dots. Look for Andrew Winger. Hit, hit the Vegas strip, baby. <laughs> but I, I, uh, dang, I, I completely, okay, there we go. Seth, your Andrew Winger bit just completely derailed me from <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm back on it now. I'm back on it now. Um, I, I, I do think there was. It's like, not a, uh, sorry, it's not a bit, okay? These are my real takes of safeties in the NFL. <laughs> Hey, he, he's a great special teamer. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah no. Wow. That it, is, that's, if that is a qualifying compliment there, that, that says a lot. <laughs> no, he, in all seriousness, he, he does some, like, cool things against the run. It's just, you know, in space, I think he led the NFL in missed tackles last year. But if that's the hill you're going to plant your flag on, Seth. I understand. Future St. Andrew Wingard, et cetera. But – I, 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 I think overall, like Jaguars who would benefit from that kind of scheme would be uh, the, the guy I keep thinking of is Andre Cisco. You know, safety, you know, they dropped him in the third round out of Syracuse. You know, he was complete ball hawk in college, you know, even sometimes to his detriment. You know, he was really, a, you know, a big risk taker. And, you know, he'd either get burnt or he'd make a big play. Uh, and he barely played uh, as a rookie. I, I think Wingard missed the last three games of the season. And then that's when Cisco got his first starts. Like they split, they split reps like 50, 50 for the first two weeks. And then they stopped doing that. And he ended up playing like five defensive snaps until the last three weeks. There's that one point where urban, you know, not to keep bringing him up, but urban got asked about Cisco and he was like, Oh, he's playing a bit more. And then somebody posted his snaps from the game and it was zero. (laughs) I know he, He's like, I don't think you even know who Andre Cisco is at this point. But once he got on the field, you know, like his first drive as a starter, he almost picked off Zach Wilson. I think he forced two fumbles last year, almost had a couple interceptions. So just getting around the ball that much and so limited reps, I think, you know, is a really good sign for him. I think he was even PFF's highest graded safety in the preseason last year. So I think he's a really athletic and versatile guy who, you know, could make an impact in a scheme like that. And then, you know, you mentioned Josh Allen. I, I do think Josh. Josh Allen is a guy who could and, you know, needs to take that step forward. I know when uh, the Jaguars first, you know, moved to a 3-4 defense last year, people kind of saw that as, you know, Allen's chance to really break out. And he did. You know, he had some of the best games of his career. I I think his two-week stretch of, 
you know, against the Bills and then against the Colts. He had like I think sixteen pressures, five tackles for loss, six quarterback hits. You know, he 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 was a terror. So he's shown the potential. It's just actually, you know, getting that consistent production. And that one thing I do like about Tampa Bay is, you know, how how much their defense sets their edge rushers up for success. You know, they do a really good job of using the interior and then even, you know, using linebackers to eat up bodies on the offensive line and looping guys in, you know, like Barrett, like Jason Pierre Paul. So I, I do think this is a scheme that could help Allen take that next step. Andre Cisco, 81.1 PFF grade in the preseason. So that's pretty good. There you, there you go. There you go. Um, yeah, let's let's uh, let's head over to the draft because the Jaguars do have the number one overall pick. People are saying, I, I, I was going to say people are saying tackle, and maybe that's because I'm saying tackle because I think like the optics tell you, especially where there's no like 100% everyone is agreed upon top five receiver, um, that you want to take a tackle with um, with your with your pick to pair him with Trevor Lawrence for a lot of years. Um, so my first question is the offensive line situation is going to shuffle out a lot differently. I think as the free agency starts, um, it was. I don't think it was a horrible offensive line. I mean, I'm not saying it's a top ten, whatever, but like I don't yeah, think it was, it was okay. Be- yeah, it was okay. Um, but but a lot of those pieces are going to be gone because I think a lot of them, if I'm not mistaken, are free agents stuff like that. So um, yeah, talk about the offensive line. You know, going to free agency, and then like, do you think that that tackle is is where they're going to go? Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with you. You know, it was it was a serviceable offensive line. I I think Lawrence and his kind of developed pocket presence and awareness as a rookie helped him out a lot. You know, he had like one of the lowest sack rates in the NFL, I think. Mm-hmm. So I, I I think overall it was an okay offensive line. I was enhanced a bit by the quarterback, but then when you look at the fact that you know that the, the thing they've hung their hat on for years is continuity. You know, they've had the same five starters for the last three seasons. Now you know you have your left tackle Cam Robinson set to hit free agency. You know he he's not a guy who you know people really look at as a big impending free agent. But I could see a team like Carolina, a team like Miami. You know, seeing him with sixty something career starts at left tackle had arguably his best year last year. I'd be I'd expect for him to kind of price himself out of the Jaguars range. Plus, mm-hmm. they already kind of drafted his replacement and Walker Little last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, left guard Andrew Norwell. You know, was one of the better linemen this past season. Said to be a free agent because they restructured his contract last year. Uh, AJ Can. You know, he started the most games for the team in the last five to six years. He's a free agent. So the only two people you have left standing are Brandon Linder, who you know for better or worse misses a ton of time. You know, I think he's missed. 40% of his possible games since he's been drafted, which which is wild for, you know, your best offensive lineman. You would think, you know, he's your most durable guy, but it's it's the opposite in Jacksonville. And then Jawan Taylor, who, you know, he's he has started, I think, I think it's like 48 out of 48 games since he's been drafted, but his best year was when he was a rookie. You know, he just right. hasn't taken that next step. So I, I, I think if you're the Jaguars right now, you have to slot at least, you know, thinking forward, slot Walker Little in at left tackle. You know, he's a guy who he impressed in three starts last year. You know, uh, both, I, I think he gave up zero pressures in the last two starts in the game. He had a solid game against a good Buffalo Bills front in week nine when he was told he was going to be a starter about five minutes before the game happened. So, I mean, just not even knowing you're going to start against the Bills and then going out there and having a solid game, I think, said a lot. But then after that, you know, you, you have to completely rebuild the, the death up front, especially in the interior because you have two starting guards leaving, uh, Tyler Shatley, who – He's basically a co-starter at center because of how much time Linder misses. He's a free agent. Will Richardson's a free agent. He's their kind of swing tackle, swing guard. He kind of goes wherever. So you're left with, I don't even know who their left guard would be right now, and then Ben Barch as a potential starter. You know, Smoothie King was a was a great brand, but I, I'm not sure you can go into an offseason, you know, comfortable with that being your lineup. So it's definitely an offensive line that needs to be overhauled, which is why I keep going to, you know, offensive line with number one overall because like you said a receiver would make a lot of sense if there was like a jamar chase or devonta smith in this class but you know there are good receivers in this class but nobody is saying take garrett wilson or chris olave with the number one overall pick you know that's just that that's not something anybody's doing you know ideally you can get a receiver at 33 who can give you something similar so i think that kind of narrows it down to offensive line or edge rusher you know, you can debate if you want to add Thibodeau or Hutchinson to put across from Allen. I do think Allen Bally needs a tag team partner because I don't think it's coincidence that his best season in the NFL came when they had Ngakwe and Campbell rushing alongside him. And since they've left, his production's kind of dipped. But I think with an offensive line that has so many pieces moving and a head coach who, you know, he, you know, Peterson 
when when he was with the Eagles, you know, he had arguably two of the best tackles in football, arguably the best center in football, and arguably the best guard in football at one point. You know, I mean, that's that's absolutely insane. So yeah. I, I think you know where he's coming from and the strong lines he even had as a coordinator in Kansas City. I think he's going to want to make the offensive line emphasis, and that's why guys like Evan Neal and even Ekwonu Ik- um, Ik- to me, you know, guys who are versatile and can kind of play inside and out, I right. think make a lot of sense for them. Yeah, I mean, that, that basically kind of covers it. What about the one they are going to take uh, at first? Here we go. Yeah, Charles oh Cross. yeah, no, oh yeah, <laughs> Charles Cross. I, I, I forgot the most, the most accurate mock draft. Did you know mock <laughs> draft is unpopular when I retweet it and be like, this isn't that bad. And I legit got like twenty replies telling me like, no man, this, this is <laughs> like, I, I, the last time I go to bat for somebody else's mock draft. But Charles Cross is a dude like I, I legit think they should consider because. You know, we, we've all talked about it, you know, a little bit before, you know, just, I mean, between us. But Evan Neal, you know, he's – I think he's going to be a really good player, but it me wouldn't too. surprise me if he'd be a better right tackle or a better left guard than he'd be, you right. know, a left tackle, you know. But Charles Cross is, I think, you know, it, like it's like watching Slater last year. You know, it's just yes. – you know, it's an automatic, you know, yes. translation to, you know, pass protecting as a left tackle. That's exactly where I'm at as well. Um, you know, a lot of their surplus in terms of draft capital – is kind of coming in like the the latter stages of the draft, right? Like like four, six round picks, if I remember right. Um, so you know, and, and this happens to be one of the years where it almost stinks to be the Jaguars and have the number one overall pick because there's not the same kind of leveraging that exists in terms of like quarterback, right? And even at like the edge rusher position, there's enough for teams to convince themselves that you can go find something a little bit later. Um, how aggressive do you think that they're going to be in this offseason? Are they going to take this as new head coach or bringing in some extra guys to the front office? Let's just maximize on the assets that are available now and then maybe have conversations about pushing the chips all in when you see more on-field results. Like, Do you expect this to be a trade-heavy draft for them, or do you think that they're just going to try to pick as many of these guys, try to get as many cheap contracts on, on the on the cap as possible, so that way maybe you can turn this into like a two- or three-year type of building process rather than trying to patch every hole right now? Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it, it's funny comparing to like basically the vibe and the fan reactions when the Jaguars got the number one pick last year. Mm-hmm. Compared to this year, it's like last year, people are ready to throw, you know, a Super Bowl parade and build Frank Gore statue, you know, forget right. the number one overall pick this year. It's like, you know, that, that office scene where it's like a plain signs, like it is your birthday with a period, you know, that, that's more or less, you know, the reaction. You know? It's like, <laughs> uh, we got the number one pick, I guess, you know, and so I, I do think that, you know, they would obviously want to get more assets. Like you said, most of their draft picks are coming, you know, in the fifth, sixth and seventh round. I think just looking at Balky's history, and this is me presuming Rick Spielman's going to have a role, but if he does, if Spielman comes in, you know, he's a dude who he loved trading back. He loved getting as many bites of the apple as you could. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of the draft, that they're going to be a team that tries to stockpile draft picks. You know, I I think the only player they moved up for last year was Jordan Smith in round four, and Uh he ended up. I think playing like 25 snaps all season or something like that. So I just, I don't think they're going to really be a team that's aggressive after, you know, the first pick, but I do think in free agency, I think they're going to try to learn their lesson from last year. I, I look like an idiot last off season for saying, you know, okay, I expect them to spend in free agency. I mean, and they technically did, you know, in terms of overall sum, they were like the third or fourth, highest spending team, but they did it by signing, you know, a million different people, you know, a bunch of like mid-level guys, no like first or and really no second tier guys, you know, like the biggest free agents name they signed was Shaquille Griffin. And, you know, like they signed Rayshon Jenkins and Roy Robinson Harris to start a contracts. You know, the, those were the quality of free agents they were looking at last year. I would expect this year to then be looking more at the guys, you know, like the Matt Judons of last year. Um, I was just going to say, so Walker Little, he started week 15, 17 and 18, I believe. I started 17 and 18 and week nine. Uh, seventy-four point four grade uh, in weeks fifteen, seventeen, eighteen. That's I think the the, the where he played his most snaps after the Bills game in week nine. Because like yeah. you said, if he yeah. if he just found out like a couple minutes before that he was starting, he won't hold that against him. But seventy-four point four grade, pretty good. I mean, like that's yeah, that's and, not bad. And, and, and he had a good tape pass coming pros, out too. Yeah, yeah. And his pass pro is like higher than the run blocking, isn't it? Yeah. Oh yes, yeah. For no, sure. I mean by far. Yeah. He, I really think Walker Little, like if he didn't have like such awful luck in college, he would have been a top 10 pick. I mean, dude, season ending injury, you know, as a sophomore, obviously that's terrible. It it wasn't a torn, it was a knee injury, but it wasn't a torn ACL or anything like that. 
he was rehabbed and ready to come back and play in 2020. And then, you know, COVID happened and he was like many Pac-12 guys, you know, uh, Jay Tefeli, another Pac-12 guy they drafted who opted out. So he went two years without playing and people kept making it sound like, oh, he hasn't played in a game and, you know, he hasn't been able to play in a game. And it was a little bit kind of a fallacy because you know, this guy could have played last year, but, you know, there was a worldwide pandemic, you know, so I, I just think if it wasn't for some bad luck, he would have been drafted a lot higher than he was because, I mean, he's – when, like, you walk up to him, dude, he he is, like, 6'7", 330, and he doesn't look it, like, at all. You know, like, he's tall, lean, his hands look like freaking catcher's mitts. Like, he's somebody who I think is going to have a really good future in the NFL. I think we're going to say the same thing about Davis Mills. Like, unlucky, unlucky college career, should have been a top sure. 10 pick. Um future Hall of Famer, just like Walker Little, his teammate as well. Whoa, whoa what the <laughs> fuck is happening right now? <laughs> I, I started nodding my head and then when I heard top Dude, 10, that's, I was like... That, that's yeah. the danger of agreeing with Seth. He's going to walk your ass out on the plank. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things I'm going to say about the draft, and this is going to be my take from now until April, um, so you're hearing it here first for the first of many times. I think the issue with the draft, with with this draft and the Jaguars having first pick in the draft, is like you would love to say, and I'm, I'm this is this has always been my my philosophy is like if you have this group, let's take the tackles for example, you have three guys in, in Cross, Equanu, and uh, Evan Neal, who are who are in this like tier one, right? Let's let's put them in a tier, right? Yeah. Tier one, these three guys, who could who are, everyone's going to have their own opinion on. I like Charles Cross. Someone else likes Evan Neal. Someone else likes Equanu, right? You should, if you're a team, you should not have too much confidence in one, one specific player out of the three. And you should say, hey, you know what? If we trade back to fifth, to seventh, whatever, and, and, and take a first round pick next year, take a second round pick this year, a third round pick, whatever it may be, you know, that's where we should go. And we'll just take the tackle that falls to us because we just don't know out of the three who's going to be good. And they're all in that tier one group, right? I think their issue this year is that because there's no like top tier quarterback, who is trading like who is going to trade up and and take that number one pick from them so they can fall back and still get a really good tackle? That would be that would be the issue because now you're in a situation where you're like, hey, we're gonna take you know one of these tackles first, or even or even whether it's Hutchison or, or Thibodeau on the defensive side, like we're gonna take this guy first. He's a position player. Um, yeah, sorry, not a position player. He's a non quarterback player. And we're gonna have to live live in this world where we have to pick the right one, and we know how picking you know picking players goes for literally everybody. Yeah. It's really really hard. So I think that that to me is is their issue. Now if they guess right, and whoever they pick again one of those five guys, or or if it's I, I assume it won't be Stingler or Hamilton, but if it even is Stingler or Hamilton, like then great, then you win and, and everything's happy. But um, but I think that's that's their issue this year with no top quarterback available for them to kind of fall back. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you completely because, I mean, just looking, you know, at the options, I, I don't know who a team is shredding up for this year. You know, like like you said, there's three tackles that I'm expecting, you know, the teams to be completely split on. You know, I, it wouldn't shock me if, you know, half the teams have Ekwanu as the number one offense tackle, the other half have Neil, some have Cross. And then, you know, even, even looking at the pass rushers, I don't think, you know, Thibodeau, for as much as I like him as a player, I mean, just reading the tea leaves on how, you know, the NFL's talking heads are kind of talking about him. I don't think the league, you know, there's going to be a team that's even moving up to number one for him. So I, I agree with you completely. I, I think, you know, really the only scenario where a trade would happen is a team falling in love with a quarterback and, you know, thinking there's no way he would fall. You know, a team like uh, – not, not to put this terrible energy out there, but, you know, the Carolina Panthers trading up, you know. <laughs> oh, for, I hope so. Oh, for, God, yeah, yeah, for Kenny Pickett. I, I Obviously, I don't think it's going to happen, but I think if there was a scenario where the number one pick gets moved, I think that's really the only shot. So if the most likely chance for you to trade a number one pick is for Kenny Pickett to go number one. You're probably, <laughs> probably stuck with it. All right. Uh, this was fantastic, John. Yeah, um, I appreciate it, guys. Hey man, I, I can appreciate the fact that you know you are you have enough integrity as a journalist to not come in here and really just give up. How frustrating! I'm sure some of this shit has been throughout this process. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to hit the reset button, be be a bit bit more positive moving forward. Be, I, I the I mean, amount it, of things that I've 
been frustrated by and I've been able to express. I'm like, I'm just ready to, okay. Doug, Doug I mean, by NFL was, terms, it quite literally can't be any crazier than it just was. Like, No, no. I mean, it, it was literally, I mean, th- things, you know, that even, you know, you get told that you can't report. I'm like, is that, like, are, are you messing with me? Or is, like, is that a real thing that happened? You know, like, it, it's a team that, you know, it's it's truly, like, you don't think it can get weirder than, you know, Urban Meyer, but it, it, it definitely got weirder than Urban Meyer over the last month. That's why, you know, it was at the point I was, you know, I was ready to hire Rich Balsamic as head coach because I'm just, <laughs> you know, I, I'm I'm ready for it to end, dude. You know, get get Rich Basquiat in there. <laughs> uh, before we get out of here, two questions. Uh, your Super Bowl pick and how is the new pup doing? Super Bowl pick, uh, Rams by 20, just because I don't want to live in a timeline where, you know, no, no offense to Bengals fans. I'm sure you guys, you know, deserve this. You, most of you are good people, but I just, I don't want to see a timeline of really the, you know, Joe Burr, you know, and th- that kind of stuff. I like no, 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 even offense to you, Seth, but we need to fight back. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm hoping the Rams win. Uh, and as for the pup, he's, he was asleep when we started, and he he no longer is. I've had to randomly mute my mic like ten times because he's been like, "Can you get you know the fuck off of that?" And <laughs> like, um, <laughs> like, like pay some attention to me. But he made it through his first podcast. Okay, I remember I went on the I went on the radio last week, and when I got done with it, somebody texted me. They're like, "Did you get a dog?" <laughs> God damn it! I need to join the pet war so that way you know I can start fucking with you and Mina and Nate. You know, I got to, I need to get something off the wall though. I'm going to get a gerbil. I'm going to have the best podcasting gerbil <laughs> that there is in this industry. <laughs> can, can a gerbil do a better mock draft than Seth Galina? I would, I would watch that podcast. I like my odds. I'll put it that yeah, way. Honestly, we're, honestly. We're actually very lucky that you came on today because uh, if you would have, you know, for the listeners, like we were trying to figure out whether to have you on Tuesday, uh, sorry, today or, or later on the week, and we ended up doing it today because we would have had to go through my entire mock draft. Like, we had nothing prepared if you weren't going to come on. So we were, we're going to have to go through every single pick uh, of the mock draft, and we're, we've, you've saved our listeners, John, so thank you very much. I saved you guys, too, it looks like. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad to help. Anytime you, anytime you don't want to talk about something, I'm sure you poured a lot of time and passion into i'm your guy (laughs) perfect all right thanks john yeah thank you guys